Good evening, everyone. I'm going to open the meeting for this evening for the meeting of the Development Review Board for the City of Montpelier. My name is Daniel Richardson. I serve as chair of the board. The other members from my right are Kevin O'Connell, Meredith Crandall, staff, Kate McCarthy, Ryan Kane, Rob Goodwin, Claire Rock. Okay, first item of business is approval of the agenda. We have three applications, two continued from last time, one new application. Uh, does anybody have any additions, changes, or alterations to the agenda? Mr. Chair, I'll make the motion to approve the agenda for the meeting, uh, for tonight's meeting, uh, as uh, as printed. Okay, motion by Kevin. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Rob. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Agenda. No comments from the chair this evening. We have the minutes of the July 8th uh, board meeting. Myself, Kevin, Kate, and Rob were in attendance and are eligible to vote. Do uh, I have any alterations or corrections to the minutes that people wish to make? Kate? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. I'm on page two in the discussion of 18 Marvin Street, I noted in the second paragraph that. There's an existing parcel of 15,000 square feet to be subdivided into 8,500 and 7,500 square feet, and that adds up to 16,000. Um, so uh, maybe we could verify the uh, acreages or the square footage of the subdivided lots. Thank you, Kate. You're welcome. Mathematical concept. That's why we play Wrap cribbage. Our fingers around. Mm -hmm. Seven plus eight is 15. <laughs> Uh, so it looks like from the application it was a 15,822 square foot parcel that they're looking to divide hmm. into 8,167 uh, for lot one and 7,655 for lot two. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Okay, uh, that correction aside, we can, which we can make, any other changes? Uh, do I have a motion to approve the minutes with the correction noted by Kate? Mm. That's eligible to vote for. Yeah. So moved. Motion by Kevin, second by Rob. Second. Uh, all those in favor are eligible to vote on the July 8th minutes. Please raise your right hand. They are approved. All right. The first item of business is 29 Franklin Street. Uh, if you'll come up to the table. And if you would state your name for the record. Hi there. My name is Mary Ann Birchlick. And, um, I'm the co-owner of this house with my right. husband, Andy. And he was here last time with Ward, and neither of them could make it. So I'm here today. Certainly understandable. So what I'm going to do is I'll put you under oath. OK. Um, so if you raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give for the matter under consideration shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? Absolutely. Great. Mr. Chair, I noted uh, off the record, but I will just note that um, although I was not here at the last meeting, I did review all of the materials and, in fact, watched the video of last uh, uh, DRB meeting for both this matter and the two Sunset Avenue. So um, although I wasn't here, I'm prepared to participate in consideration of those, if that's perfectly accepted. Great. Great. Thank you very much. I also was not at these meetings prior. Yes. Uh, I didn't watch the video, but I read all the information and talked with Meredith and provided me with an update on um, the two applications. Okay. Well, I, I think that's where you feel comfortable making a decision. Good. Um, okay, so we'll go forward with that, and then unless there's any objections no. from the applicant. The, uh, the only thing I don't know if um, what I would add to to following the other meeting, which of course I was not at, is that the um, ward has gone ahead and redu reduced the plan for the um, impermeable surface area as requested by the 200 square feet. And um, also, he brought this to Tom McCardle of Public Works. I'm sorry if I'm already telling you things. That oh, you no, know. no, this oh, is no, all this is A good, a good summary good. of what's been added is perfect. Okay. So he, he uh, Tom McCardle signed off on the, the two-foot addition to the porch. Okay. Um, we have some photos here of other setback violations that are um, common in, in this particular neighborhood. 
um, but also, as, as he mentioned, uh, Tom McCarroll didn't think it was a problem. Okay. Um, and just to. Sorry? That's all the items I think I have. Okay, and, and we, have those, we have those. We have those in our packet. We have the the, the drawing uh, that's dated. It looks like it's dated July 9th. Yep. And it looks like Tom has actually signed off, physically signed off on on it. And on the back side, it looks like there are photographs of adjoining or uh, other neighbors in the neighborhood with porches that are very close to the uh, setback. That's right. The, the one on the lower left is actually our, na our direct neighbor, and that is the porch right there um, with that kind of oval window on the front door. Mm -hmm. So it would, um, it would come out to the end of the staircase, basically. That makes any sense to me. And is this, this is your primary residence? Or? Yes. OK. Um, and then the other drawing looks like uh, a revised architectural drawing showing the uh, permeable surface and impermeable surface. That's right. Okay. So my understanding from your statements as well as the representations and the, the, the drawings are that uh, you've now reduced the impermeable area so that that's no longer uh, an issue, it, or it's below the 65%? Yes. Okay. Um, so I want to actually uh, flag this for the board. Um, this is an issue actually Kate raised at the last meeting. Thanks. This is an issue Kate raised at the last meeting as to our understanding um, of what our ability with the uh, coverage issue is, and I'm looking for the exact language. So it talks about a waiver, coverage maximum waiver is 5% or 2,000 square feet more than the district standard, whichever is less. So in this district, 60% is the standard. Um, uh, coverage for a lot that's allowed. So the waiver, the question is, does the 5% mean 65% or is it 5% of 60%, if I'm framing that correctly? So is it 5% yeah. of some amount or is it 5 percentage points? Right. So 5 percentage points would leave you, bring you from 60% lot coverage to 65 whereas 5% of the existing impervious surface would get you a different number. I see. Um, have we done the math on both of those approaches, given the reduced amount of, of impervious surface under the new design? Uh, you know what? I, I didn't do that. I went for more of a big picture analysis as to whether, as to looking at what makes sense when you take that coverage maximum waiver and apply it to some of the more extremes. So we have some, um, like in the rural district, your maximum coverage amount is 20%. Mm -hmm. So, and the minimum lot size is two acres. So that's roughly 87,000 square feet for a minimum lot size. But so, changed to one mm, nope. So if you have a, you know, your 87,000 square foot minimum lot size and you're only allowed 20% coverage, that gets you to 17,424, just to get you exact max. If you're only saying that your maximum waiver from that is 5% of that coverage amount versus five percentage points, you're only adding 871 Square feet additional coverage, which is I wouldn't when say you're only, I mean, I think um, yeah, but feet. when you're talking about an eighty-seven thousand square foot parcel, mm -hmm. that's a pretty small amount. But that's also one of the largest. I mean, one of the larger parcel size, so it makes sense because the alternative is or two thousand square feet, which is whichever is less. And for right. what Meredith is saying, even on a, a large lot with a very low 
uh, developability, very low coverage allowed, you're still nowhere near 2,000 square feet. So if we do it as 5% of the impervious, it's never going to get close to 2,000 square feet, and therefore, it's 5%. Therefore, therefore the 2,000 square then foot the 2,000 square foot doesn't mean anything. It's always going to be the other one. So I think, and it makes sense to me that if you're measuring it in percentages of the lot, and you get a 5% bonus, that would also be of the lot. So it's a five percent. Five. It's supposed to be five percentage points, and it's. I think it's a language issue, yeah. Because your other dimensional standards, down below, at the bottom of that figure three hundred six, it's referring to by not more than ten percent. They can get away with that because I don't think any other dimensional standard is a percentage, and I think this is a just an error in language and a. a people drafting this and not realizing that it should say five percentage points. I think, yeah, when you rationalize it out, it, that 2,000 square foot or less mm -hmm. option okay. just doesn't ever, won't ever apply. So I think this is a good thing for us to contemplate and communicate with the Planning Commission about. I, in, in addition, um, I think that all of the initial discussion with the applicant was based on the five percentage point interpretation. Mm -hmm. So, out of fairness, we should probably stick with that, even if we revise our view mm -hmm. later. Though I appreciate the analysis, and I, I bet you were going to recommend that. Well, yeah, there's, and, and I've, I've talked with the planning director about this issue mm -hmm. um, and about having that change to five percentage points mm -hmm. for the zoning fix, because it just didn't make sense. I would, st I mean, it, it would still be good to talk with the planning commission about intent if possible, so, but not for tonight. Not for tonight's purposes. I mean, we're also saying under the five percentage points interpretation, the increase is 185 square feet. Mm -hmm. it, so I think if you did it the other way, if it were five percent of the existing, existing impervious surface, then then that's going to be uh, another factor less. And then then your waiver. 550 additional. No, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. 55. 55 additional. instead of 185. But yeah, yeah. yeah, allowing a waiver for 55 square feet, uh, right. it doesn't doesn't seem like it doesn't seem like it that doesn't would make be the sense. Intent. Exactly. It, it, the intent it, would. I mean, logic dictates that the the from what we know, the intent would be the uh, the, the, the full More lot. But, but I can understand. I can understand Kate your view uh, in that. Uh, it's important enough of an issue that we should raise it to the to the planning commission. My guess would be <laughs> that they're going to say, "Yeah, we meant the lot." <coughs> right. I appreciate that discussion because the the lack of precision in that part of the zoning, I was hung up on it. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, and I, any other thoughts on that? Okay. I, I I think that's the consensus that the board has that it would be the five percentage point. So, given that. The impervious surface is no longer, um, well, it's it's now within the 5% um, waiver so that we're not faced with a challenge of can we go beyond what we've been uh, designated by the bylaws to give the 5% waiver. So in that respect, does anyone have any further questions on the impervious surface that's being added to this? Or, um, that was just a... In the original plan, Ward paved more of the driveway right. than is currently paved, but we're just not going to do that. Which, anyway, so it, that's what it's specifically related to is the driveway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I mean, I should say that, you know, these, these, we're going through the first two years of really testing some of these bylaws and some of these waivers, which were a new concept as of January of 2018. Oh, I see. So some of these, numbers as you can see we're we're trying to figure out how exactly these these numbers are applied and what they look like and you know to a certain extent whether these numbers make sense um so certainly taking that off of our plate and just making it a very straightforward application of this makes it a far easier decision um but that leads us then to the frontage issue, which, as I understand, um, so from last time, and this was Rob's issue, um, is that um, what you're proposing to do 
with the front porch is bring it out to the edge of the steps. That's correct. Um, and we had, a, we had a discussion last time that, in fact, the steps are not part of the structure, porch structure, for purposes of figuring out where the front of the porch was. Ward made the argument that, you know, by bringing out to the steps, you weren't increasing the nonconformity, where I think we have to look at this as increasing the nonconformity uh, by bringing the porch out to the steps. Okay. Um, so if the, so as I, sorry, wrong drawing. One of the reasons it's asked, we came up with the idea in the first place is because, and I think maybe Ward mentioned this, it's a safety matter of ice. I saw it almost hit two people last winter, um, the, mm -hmm. the mailman delivering the mail and someone who was approaching, you know, someone I had over. So that was what we were trying to address when Ward suggested, well, if we just brought the, the roof out over, to, over the steps, that would happen. That would be the way to protect someone from that in the future. So, just so I understand, the um, nothing's changed about the the front porch. It's just that we've got now now have sign off from Tom McArdle saying that he has no no issue with this. Plus, you have the additional information that this, in fact, is consistent with the pattern of the development in the neighborhood. Yes. And the use of the structures. So. And just so we're clear on the numbers, right now the roof to setback is, a, is about 7 feet 8 inches. And you're proposing to come out uh, what looks like 2 feet 7 inches. So that the roof to setback will now be 5 feet 1 inch. I'm not seeing that. Oh, sorry. I know it's, 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 the roof is, it's, would, would come out an additional two feet. But right. I don't have the actual, if, but it's, if I have on it. On the one signed off by Tom. I see. On There's, the one signed off by Tom, the current roof to set back versus the proposed oh, roof right. to set back. Okay. I see now. Right. And that's, that's what we're going off of for this. So. Mm -hmm. Rob, in part, this was to go to, I think you raised a valid concern about that, um, you know, whether or not this was going to cause any issue with the uh, Department of Public Works. But then if we go to sorry, the table on this, which is? The uh, table? Same table six we were on. Are yeah. The waiver limitations or the waiver 4-02? Waiver hearing review criteria? I think it's 4-02. Okay, because that's the review criteria. Right. I thought we already went through the, no. oh, oh, because you're looking at the neighborhood issue. Yeah, right. so that's page 4-21. Or at least that's what it is in the interim. Sorry, I have, might have a slightly different page number. It's okay. Yeah, so, okay. So, when we look at waivers, we've got two criteria. The variance, the waiver in this case, if authorized, shall not alter the essential character of the neighborhood or district in which the property is located, substantially or permanently impair the lawful use or development of the adjacent property, reduce access to renewable energy resources or be detrimental to public welfare. So I understand the additional information really going to that criteria there that we have an answer from both public works as well as, uh, you know, a, a sure fit of evidence that this in fact is consistent with the character of the neighborhood. Um, the other criteria for the waiver is that the proposed land development is beneficial or necessary for the continued reasonable use of the property. Um, and that was more of the testimony, I believe, last time where, um, where both Ward and Andrew testified that this was a re this, this increased the usability of the porch, um, which at the current time um, 
is a little bit restricted because of the, narrow. the narrowness of it. Um, so this, we then go back to you know, what we can do for the waiver, and that is three dash zero six. To figure 3-06 in section 3002 yep. as interacts with your initial waivers clause 4602A that specifies that the board may approve waivers um, as specified in these regulations. Right. So we have waiver limitations, a maximum waiver for um, what has side and rear? Right. Well, that's the thing, is that there isn't a specific front setback waiver right. so in here at all, so we had to go with the other dimensional standards. Right. And so honestly, I don't know if that's just an oversight by people in failing to set a front setback waiver mm -hmm. or if it's supposed to be in other dimensional standards. But it's that's where it falls with the way this is drafted. Right. So the issue here is that what we're talking about is, is more than 10%. Yes. Right. Because the just for background, to make sure I have this right, the required front waiver or setback in the district is 10 feet, and what the bylaw is telling us is that the maximum we can waive is 10 percent, so one foot. Where's mm -hmm. the this is page three dash eight. Based on the information provided in the application, it's more than 10 percent. And that's what we're yeah. yeah. Where's the so it because there's nothing that says you can't have a front setback waiver anywhere. Mm -hmm. So then it logically must fall under other dimensional standards waiver limitation. Right. I mean, the, the, the problem is is that if we look at the other setback requirements for dimensional, um, the side says 10 feet less than the district standard, but not two less than five feet. Um, rear setback says 10 feet less than the district standard, but not less than 10 feet. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, does that front yard setback at one foot, which is a somewhat brutal standard, um, is that consistent with the other setbacks? Well. Some of these side and rear setback limitations mm -hmm. don't actually get you any waiver allowance because in many many right. places well, the side setback is already five feet. Same the rear may same already rear. be ten feet. So sometimes you don't you don't get a setback waiver allowance. Right. So <laughs> what we have is a bit of a procedural, a bit of a nullity as far as whether or not this waiver can actually apply because the side and rear setbacks in this particular district would not seem to be even eligible with the 10, with the minimum 10 foot and the minimum 5 foot. Correct. Where's the property line? I, I was really confused looking at this because the this dotted line is labeled front yard setback. Yep. And then the roof to setback is, the, is what we're talking about, the distance. Right. Yeah, I set back to I mean this shouldn't this dotted line I don't think is the setback, right? That's That's actually the public right of way. The edge of the right of way? Yeah. Yep. It's there's some mislabels on here. That front okay. yard setback line label yeah. should be public right of way slash property boundary. But they, they don't know exactly where that is. You measure from the edge of the right of way rather than from the edge of the property. Um, so that's figure three dash O two on page three dash four where if the location of the front lot line is unknown, it will be assumed to be 25 feet from the street center line or half of the street right of way if the right of way is not 50 feet, which is why we needed to get Tom McArdle's sign off of where the right of way is shown on the um, document that he signed off on July 9th. So he was aware that the front yard setback line is actually supposed to be public right of way. But, but that's not... That's still the line that's depicted on the site plan 
isn't the property line because we don't know the distance from the center line. Is that no, this is this is co Tom's confirmation that this dotted line in the front is what we're assuming is the edge of the right is of the way. edge of the right of way, which means it's the f counted as the front property line. So the current setback. Roof to the current setback amount is seven feet eight inches to the front of the porch, not the front of the steps. And then mm -hmm. the proposed new setback from the public right of way line, which we're also assuming is the property line, will be five feet one inch to the front of the porch. Because we've had to assume where the property line right. is based on a the city's understanding of where the public right of way is. Right, and this was actually based off of surveys that had been found. Yep, in the Department of Public Works records. Right. I, I mean, but like if you look at the 3 02 illustration here, it's the, the depicted setbacks are from the edge of the sidewalk. Mm, no. Well, that's three dash two. You're measuring from the, that little arrow way right to the top. Yep. Your setback. That's a minimum water setback. This is just saying. Now I'm confused. The minimum front is measured right. from the edge of the depicted sidewalk to mm, the line that is shown no, as minimum front. Yeah, that's a different. Uh, right. So well, right, right, right. So that's how they've drawn that front. Property that just, boundary. Yeah, that that just happened to be the way that that drawing shows. But as right. this this lot, the lots we dealt with last two weeks ago on East State Street, and other many other lots in Montpelier are um, are not so clean. Where, in fact, the um, the minimum the the setback uh, goes into the front yard. You mean wait, wait wait you mean you mean the the right of way, not the setback. I'm sorry. The, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, here the the right, the right of, in many cases the right of way extends beyond well, the, the back line of the sidewalk. I think that's very common. And, right. But right. I don't know. But it also when that's the case, it doesn't then necessarily make sense to me that the setback would be from the public right of way rather than every other setback which is from the property line. No. Here the assumption is that the public right of way is the property line. That's the, that's what's the problem here. We don't know where the prop property line is. There isn't a survey that it that documents that, but there is a survey that documents where the public right of way extends to, and they can't build stuff in the public right of way because technically that's the city's property. So I, th I think right what it's not. I think what's con part of what's confusing here is that the distance between the sidewalk and what we're calling the and the edge of the right of way that appears to us intuitively as functionally part of the front yard. Mm. And so this line that we're discussing, the edge of the public right of way, which is being presumed to be the property boundary, feels a little artificial as mm -hmm. we're talking about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's what we're all getting hung up on, right? Okay. Even though we appreciate, and, and based on the points that you brought up, that that is the legal boundary, um, right? That's no. not what you meant. No. Okay, take that back. I think so you were, what do I understand? But you want a clarity about that, that, that it would not undermine any future public works projects. Well, I, yeah, I think that uh, I, I interpret Tom's statement as he has, doesn't see any issues with it. Mm. Um, he says, to the best of their knowledge, that, you know, essentially, that represents the right of way. But I don't think, you know, I think if a surveyor came in and came to a determination where it is, I'm, I'm not sure that he wouldn't, he, he, by saying this, he doesn't, he can't disagree with it. He's just saying, like, what's here is sufficient for me. I don't believe that, that this is going to be in the city right of way. So, we're, you know, we're fine. Right. Uh, I think... Uh, what we're talking about here is we don't know where it is. So if we're talking about a 10% waiver, well, it may be, it might be at the edge of the sidewalk. We don't, we don't, we don't know. There's, there's not a cert. I haven't seen a survey in the record that that comes to a determination as to where the right of way is, where the property line is, which is fine. Well, but it's they're the same thing in this case. You could you could interchange a boat property line or the, or, the, or the right of way for the paper system identifying mean, a setback. This survey segment here that it seems to indicate in uh, an iron rod in the corner here, which, while it isn't depicted on Ward's sketches, 
I mean, that, that this is a line that we're talking about, right? From this, mm -hmm. from, uh, well, I understood Ward testifying to last week was that this, this iron rod pin mm -hmm. and this line that was even with it, um, he took that and then plugged it in, and that's the dotted line here. Um, And that's consistent because what's happened is is that the, you know you look at the survey segment that we have, and the the line seems to move further away from Franklin um, as it goes towards the corner intersection with Cross Street. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I just uh, you know maybe it's just the opinion of one member of the board. Um, I think that this note from Tom pose, gives us the ability to say that there's not going to be an issues with public works. Yep. I don't think that the information in the record is information that constitutes the location of the right of way being known. Right. Uh, and I think there's a clear pathway in these regulations where you do not need to provide a survey, you do not need to uh, you know, go digging in, you do not need to try and find any iron rods. Uh, it's, you know, these regulations it's a it's a measurement from the center of the of the, of the street, right? Uh, and, you know, and that's the that's the physical object that everybody can go by, so that there's you know equality all along all along the street, and everyone's measuring from the same spot when things are unknown. Right. right. So does the <clears throat> does Tom McArdle's assertion that Does Tom McArdle's assertion that there will not be issues with this project as far as the right of way is concerned make it so that we can basically use the sidewalk as the point from which we set back because functionally that area oh. behaves like front yard? Uh, I thinking out loud here. Yeah. yeah. I don't think that's what Tom's saying. I'm saying if He's speaking to the impact of the port on the right away, right? Right, because you're saying, oh, he's not actually... He's not making a property line determination. He's saying that this yeah. project will not interfere with future road maintenance. So here's here's the question. Is that what you want to hang your hat on, on everybody who might come and say, we want a waiver that's more than the waiver that's in here, as long as we don't impact the front, the, the, the city right of way, mm -hmm. that's enough for the board to grant a waiver beyond the explicit waiver maximum that you've been has been you know flowed down to you. Right. I think that's a good fairness point. Well, I mean the other the other point I think Ryan was getting toward um, is you know and and this is maybe what's troubling us is that you have close to five feet of front yard that while within the right of way would appear to be any type of, would appear to be part of the setback. And so when we talk about measuring for purposes of this calculation and waiver, and I, I just, I don't think that there's necessarily a way to get there. Um, given the dimensional standards and the instructions that we have that are fairly clear that we're talking about setback from a boundary point that in this case is the um, is the front yard setback and yeah I mean, you know, it, it leaves a lot of unused space on the table. And yeah, I mean, unused I, space that the city could decide to take away and put in, widen the street and put a better shot. Oh, I, I, I think public landscaping, planting trees, and, you know, whatever uh, 50 years down the road type of transportation structure we <laughs> well, I, may I, have. I understand that, but don't forget, you know, they're not proposing to put mm -mm. the porch into the right of way. They're just proposing to put the porch closer to the right of way, and it's not even the closest porch to the right of way mm -hmm. um, in the um, abutting neighbors, and that and that's I think what's um, 
giving us some pause. And that, you know, certainly the stairs, it would be a nice way to sort of look at that with the existing stairs, but I, I think that's foreclosed upon as well. Um, yeah. yeah. This is a 3-02. This illustrated setback dimensional standards is the only place in the regulations that makes this assumption as to the property line being coextensive with the edge of a three-rod right-of-way. I believe so. For these small local roads. I mean, one, assuming that it's a, a three-rod right-of-way, that, uh, you know, Franklin Street is a three-rod right-of-way. But it's like, I think the idea of the setback is a functional one to keep things back from a road. Uh, the three-rod right-of-way is a legal fiction that just sets the, the a legal right for the city to maintain and do what they need to do within it, but. Well, it, I mean, it's more than a legal fiction. I mean, that's the law. If right, you but don't so, know the and the city has a right to, but I think the function of the right-of-way is what Tom McArdle is saying. We need an ability to run lines and pipes and sidewalks and infrastructure and whatever we need to do within that right-of-way, and the city has that. The setback is more of a, a uniformity of development, of making sure you're not too close or, as this illustrates, too far from the road to kind of keep the character of the neighborhood. And that why, it, that's why it makes so much more sense to me to think about this front yard setback from, you know, either the sidewalk or Franklin Street rather than this right-of-way line which we don't even know for sure is coextensive with the property line, and we're basing on this assumption of a, of a three-rod, 50-foot. I mean, I, I, I agree conceptually. However, I mean, I think there's a practical problem. If you just even just look at the measurements, there's a five-foot, four-inch sidewalk, and then four feet, eight inches of, uh, of yard before you get to the front yard setback. So setting aside Rob's concerns about whether this is the actual setback, assuming for a moment that it is, you know, under this analysis of going from right of well, the the Franklin, setback. what we keep calling it setback. I'm sorry, the, the here, right of way line. Confusing right of way line, uh, and we're measuring the setback is, from the right of way line. It, it, that's exactly what we're doing, and I keep messing it up. Um, but if we if if we were to measure the setback from Franklin Street, um, you could using that analysis that analysis. That it's 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 over ten feet to get to the right of way line, um, and so technically, you using that as your starting point, you could build within the right of way, and I don't think any one it, wants it's not, that. The, this, we're still talking about waivers. It's not like you can just build within the right-of-way. The DRB could hypothetically approve a structure within the right-of-way under that analysis, but again, only upon meeting the standards that we've set forth, and certainly upon hearing input from the Public Works Department, who, if there was an issue with the DRB granting a waiver for somebody to build under that analysis, it would be, you know, eight inches into the public right of way. They could raise that concern and we could deny it for that reason. I don't know if I'm, I'm that sanguine about the idea of being able to approve building within a right of way for a not, for the, for a private entity. Um, I mean, that's encroaching into the, into the right of way. I, Let's be clear that that's not what's being proposed. And here. that's yeah. what not what's <laughs> being proposed here. I, I, I mean, I'm, no, I'm not. We're, we're kind of. You're thinking it through, I guess. We're going to apply sort of lenience here. I kind of be actually more interested in exploring not that under the, you know, 10% of the setback, but uh, go back and look at the building to the north and building to the south. Mm -hmm. um, now, that didn't. I think you look at the building to the south, uh, and that is a, I believe, a commercial apartment building. Three units. With and there's parking in between the you know, design parking. So it's like it's, that certainly doesn't fit the character of the houses on the street. And so I'm interested if we look at going one house down, you know, further south mm -hmm. um, would be maybe the more appropriate you know, house down, house north, since that whole part of the regulation sort of written more maintaining the character of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I kind of, I just don't see us getting, we can, uh, it seems like pretty clear we can improve one foot, which is 10% of 10 feet. And what's proposed here is asking for more than that. Yeah. And so I, I think the, the second. Right, but not only that, but we're, we're 
if we measure from the right of way line, again, setting aside whether this is the actual one, I think we're beyond that, that waiver mm -hmm. capacity because yeah. it talks about one We can't one even foot. grant one foot. You can only yeah. have a total of, so that the nonconformity would be a total of one foot. The nonconformity is already I, a oh, two plus feet. I mean, in, in, some, in some ways, and I'm, um, we may want to simply take this into deliberative session. Um, uh, you know, this, this reminds me of why the general variance criteria was often better for this particular type of thing. Except that it's since been amended to be more strict. And when well, you can apply it. Mr. Chair, can I just interject at this yes. point? Um, this is one really small application. We have a sign off by the Director of Public Works. We're not going to solve this issue on this one application, nor is it fair to the applicant. No. I think we should use our common sense caps and look at this as the individual incredibly small impact that it's going to have for one foot or mm -hmm. either direction and, and let's move on. Okay. And, I mean this is this is part of the record and, and when we deal with this in a, in a holistic fashion then this will be one one of the you know items that will that will be used as part of the evidence to back that up but uh, right now I think you know let's make note of it but let's move on. I, 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 think I could add to that. that I'm sort of picturing the, the bell curve of property parcel sizes that we have throughout this city. And this parcel in question is 0.04 it's, acres. It's, yeah. it's on this it's little really tail small. end of, of the bell curve. So the likelihood that we're going to be dealing with this is, is quite exceptional. Yeah. So it, it becomes, as, as Kevin is saying, a data point in our interpretation yes. that we need to be cautious about. I think a data point is. But is, it's a data is, point um, for a pretty exceptional lot. I was just wanting to note that in the staff report um, on page five, there is an indication of a, um, I think it's kind of references a prior decision, but I don't believe that was actually a decision that was made for a similar application. You're right. Thank you. The, the, the applicant ended up withdrawing that application. So you're right. That was not an actual decision. Thank you. Well, okay. I mean, you know, What's the pleasure of the board? Do you want to entertain a motion, as Kevin's suggesting, or do we want to put this into deliberative session and uh, masticate a little bit more on it um, to come to some consensus? I mean, I, I, I see I see Kevin's point, and I'm I'm certainly inclined. You know, I think there's a reasonably justifiable sort of taking Kevin's point and Brian's and synthesizing them which is if you just went from the edge of the sidewalk um, as something that's a really reasonable, seemingly clear point of view uh, for a point of measurement here on this particular lot, then you're within the 10% um, because your measurement from that is going to be 9 feet 9 inches from the edge, from the edge of the sidewalk. Yes. I guess I'm still concerned by what is stated in the regulation as far as um, what's stated under figure 3-02 about how you would measure that setback using the right of way. So I feel like we have to kind of recognize that and recognize we, the statement of the 10% the We We can recognize that. I mean, you know, I guess in a way of recognizing it and then tossing it to the side is... Um, is to say that you know these are these figures. There's a question as to whether these figures contain the same sort of um, import as the numbered bylaw um, provisions. And the fact is, is that the planning commission did not give a definitive uh, statement as to front yard setbacks. So we're already in a very gray area, and that we're dealing with. Um, you know, sort of these this other dimensional standard. They haven't chosen to call out front yard setbacks in any particular way, and I, I can interpret that as a way of giving us as a board some degree of latitude as to how we um, how we interpret these front yard setbacks a little bit more and some flexibility. Um, and then you have, I think, 
what, what Ryan pointed out, which was the, the, the contradiction that while it does recommend that you have the, lo you, you do locate the front yard setback when it's not otherwise identified by a survey line as 25 feet from the, the center line, the drawing itself seems to indicate the sort of logical point of the edge of the sidewalk. Um, so I think in a case by case analysis, where if this was a really sort of um, solitary, large parcel, single thing where this might represent a significant encroachment towards the right of way, we might have a different type of analysis, but sort of taking these various pieces and taking the illustrations for what they are, which are illustrations, not necessarily binding di dictates, more dicta than dictates. Um, you know, using our common sense, we we go from this sidewalk in this application, and and make clear that this isn't necessarily precedential because we're we're, we're trying to feel our way through, and given the very specific qualities of this this particular lot, this particular layout, um, the safety improvements, the actual improved functionality from being non-functional mm -hmm. to a functional porch that'll add to the character of the area. There's right. a lot of great testimony as why it makes a lot of sense to do what they're doing. We're wrestling with how do we figure out to do it under the bylaws, and I think that um, given that all of the reasons and everything we've discussed, I feel comfortable that at least in this case, uh, this is something that that we should be allowing to go forward rather than not allowing uh, based on some uh, strange reading of a figure of a, of a illustration. Um, I mean, it's not strange, it's strict. Strict, strict exactly. That's what I intended to say. And by that view, I mean, I mean what we're doing is, is we're using the common sense approach and, and as Kate puts it, it's a data point in the continuing analysis uh, as we go through this. I would okay. say that I very much agree with what everyone else has uh, said and that I think that it's very reasonable uh, based on everything not to get hung up on the specific you know, numbers here. Um, I, I think that this discussion has been incredibly helpful for yes. guidance to further applications for setback waivers to so that uh, maybe the applicant actually has to do less work in order to get to the point at which they're at before they even come before us. But uh, I don't think it's fair for the applicant to go back and collect more information when they've done nothing but be diligent. Yeah. And as, as always, when we have discussions like this with these relatively new bylaws, we thank you <laughs> for well, being a part of it and recognizing that we are we are learning and that's costing you some of your time in the process. But thank you. Well, thank very much. all of you. It's been an admirable deliberation, <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> very detailed. Nothing if not thorough. <laughs> well, the ship's not into port yet. What? Uh, how do we want to? Proceed. I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve uh, both the request for the renovation and enlargement of the front porch, including uh, extending the front porch to approximately two feet uh, as depicted uh, beyond the existing front porch, um, as well as approve the creation of the rear patio. Um, and in doing so, we're granting a waiver of the impervious coverage uh, to 65% of the subject parcel. Okay, so motion by Ryan. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, and would any discussion? <coughs> uh, just I suggest maybe as a as just simply because that's what we've t titled it. We call it a setback waiver request, a granting of, of the setback waiver request. Yeah, I'll, I'll accept that friendly amendment to okay. the motion. All right. Um, all those in favor of the motion, please raise your right hand. All those opposed? I'm going to abstain. Okay. One abstention. You have your permit. Or okay. you have approval. The permit will be forthcoming. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for your patience. Thanks Thank for your time. Thank you. All right. We are on to 2 Sunset Avenue. Okay. I'll just say that I was up there um, over the weekend and just visually, I didn't talk to anybody. Good. Yeah. No, I, I, I drove by as as well. Um, I did not take, I did not stop. Um, I consulted uh, Google Maps Street View. <laughs> uh, up and down a couple times with the little clicker arrows. Well, I mean, I, I'll just remind the board, I think, because, you know, if we do take views, that's perfectly legitimate. 
um, but it doesn't become evidence or uh, part of the record unless we make it so. So merely going out and visiting without coming back and saying, this is what we saw, um, or this is our impression if we wish to do so. Um, you know, is an important part. In that case, may I elaborate on something I observed, and you, you can tell me whether this is record entering or not? Yep. Um, so what I observed, it, we heard discussion last meeting about some driveways being pretty much, in the neighborhood, being pretty much flush with sunset, and other driveways having a little bit of a dip mm -hmm. to get into their own garages and driveways. And what I noticed is that the driveway, the only two driveways that really have much of a dip are two sunset, which we're discussing in this application, and one sunset across the way. The others don't have that dip going up. And that is relevant because we've talked about visibility, and we've also talked about neighbors dealing with the same circumstances as far as what it takes to get out of their driveway onto the road. And so what I note is that one and two sunset deal with that circumstance of getting up and onto the road over a little hill um, more so than the others. That's a small thing, but it came up last time, so that's that's my take on it. Great. So if you would mind stating your names for the record, please. Howie Michelson. Allison Mayany. Okay. Uh, and you were both put under oath at the last hearing. You understand that you're still under oath as well? Yes. Okay. So... I'll, I'll wait. Okay. Um, Okay, so when we last left off, I believe one of the concerns, one of the primary concerns about going back was what type of uh, landscape you were proposing for this, this driveway. Um, and I see that you have a new site plan that contains a few drawings, so if you'd like to explain and put onto the record. I might gave out all mine, but uh, if you'd like here, you can share. <laughs> I can share. And just a note, we don't have the actual colors here, so you might want to state which is oh, which. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, and certainly if you want to label things and, and yeah. submit that to Meredith for our, our records, that's certainly fine. So the, the green is um, existing, and the red would, is proposed. Um, the, I'm not sure what needs to be elaborated on, uh, particularly except our intent to bring in at least a few fairly large bushes of uh, um, uh, So we met, we met again with our, um, our yep. landscaper, um, Jacob, and so he came over and he looked at the plan that we had already talked about and had made a few more suggestions. And he also um, wrote a letter um, mostly focusing on um, his thoughts on the safety issues mm -hmm. and for some reason didn't add information about the landscaping piece. I'm not sure why even though we asked him to do that. But um, so do you have a copy of that I, letter for us? I, electronic copy. I didn't print it. I, mean, I sent it to you, but I only just recently. Okay. So uh, I could read it, or how do you want to proceed? Because yeah, they could read it. We could also display it up here potentially. No. Okay. Let's read it. Read it. Okay. Right. You want to? Did you want to display? No, no, display. Yeah. Go ahead and read it. Uh, dear City of Montpelier, I'm writing. The, this is uh, Jacob Miller of Jacob Miller Landscaping Plain Plainfield. Um, I'm writing this letter on behalf of the Michelsons pertaining to their application for a second curb cut. I feel a second curb cut would increase the safety of entering and exiting their property by allowing them to pull in and turn around to drive out as opposed to the current situation which forces drivers to back in or back out of the existing driveway. The new driveway and curb cut would also increase the amount of off-street parking which at this time hinders the neighbors from backing uh, the neighbor from backing out of her driveway. I think he was referring to one set set one sunset. If we if somebody comes over and parks next to our driveway, that blocks her ability to come out. Um, 
I have done some work for the Michelsons and did on street parking. Parking below their driveway made the street very narrow where the street turns 90 degrees, parking above their driveway. I had to move every time the neighbor across the street wanted to pull in or out of her driveway. If parked in the driveway, it is very difficult for the vehicle on the lower side of the driveway to see past the upper vehicle. In addition to the safety benefits of adding this curb cut and the driveway in the location plan, we hope to retain the large oak tree above their existing driveway. The current driveway is very close to the tree and has damaged some of the route. With the inevitable of inevitability of new drivers in this household in the next few years, it is likely the damage and stress on this tree will increase eventually leading to the removal of this beautiful tree. The new driveway would move the vehicle traffic a safe distance away from the exposed tree roots, thus lowering the stress and damage that could be caused. Thank you. Um, so, go ahead. Sort of reiteration of stuff that we've already said. Sure. But, um, um, so if Meredith has a copy of that, she can just simply put that into the record and you already emailed that I to me earlier to okay email to okay just so just so i understand as far as the landscaping is concerned uh, and i'm looking at the drawing that you've submitted you have the two oaks on either side of the existing driveway correct and then there's a red blot that would be a Proposed. new shrub yeah um any specification as to what a, kind of a nine bark is supposed to live in the shade of an oak tree um, so it's a shady spot um, because the oak gives quite a bit of um, cover right um, uh, but it is a tree that's not invasive and a bush that gets rather large um, and it's not invasive that you, we know of and you said a nine place. bark is that nine bark yeah so I don't think it's the only thing, but it, it I think it's what we've narrowed down okay. to what could actually live. Um, we were a little uh, reluctant to say specific variety of plant at each one of these locations, only because we wanted to be able to respond to what the situation was when we were done doing the work. And um, uh, it just, it, it our intent is for it to be as good a year-round screening as we can get. So would it make sense to have a non-invasive large woody shrub um, that would get to, you know, three to four feet tall? So our, that's what we had hoped, but our, um, our landscaper said that no shrub would live, no evergreen shrub would live. Um, right under that but if, if okay. uh, well I, yeah and i wasn't necessarily proposing an evergreen but a large just a large woody shrub meaning any of any of these as opposed to like a perennial yeah so a nine um, mark i think that's considered yeah. to be a large um woody so it's going to yes. be a large woody shrub so mr chair it's going to get that, that size are you beginning to explore what a definition of shrub type in a condition could be yes Not, you don't have to pick and the exact we're species talking now about actually, we're agreeing on a type Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think we're talking about one that actually would get larger than three or four feet. We're talking something that might reach five, six, seven feet in okay. height. And in fact, we're hoping to be able to bring in ones that are already fairly large, not, you know, putting in a, a half a foot plant and hoping that in 10 years it's going to do screening. For so just so that we're not trying to define things that aren't already defined, if you look in your landscaping section in 3203, so that's on, you, you should all have this, the updated um, interim landscaping provision. Um, your planting specifications, a large shrub is greater than or equal to six feet high at mature maintained height. Um, and then it needs a 12 square foot minimum planting area. So I mean we can we can pick some of the the okay. heights from here as long as they're able to then I mean I know this is from the landscaping requirements that technically don't apply here, but if we're talking about screening and landscaping, we probably want to make sure that we've got no nope, minimum planting areas to help it live and right. just use these standards. Um, and then and then going along you have the existing maple bush that's there. 
it's shown in some of the pictures. And then another large shrub, the, the okay. red. Yeah. Or the, the barriers, yeah. you know, maybe much of the width of that space. Or okay, so maybe maybe multiple. Yeah. Well, um, it's tricky. There's a, what's uh, on the property next to it is, which is not drawn, is a very large um, maple tree. So mm -hmm. it's again, it's a trouble. It's a tricky spot because it's um, you know it's shady and it's competing with some significant roots. Um, so, but we would like to put in some sort of um, shrub okay. there as well. And then there are three existing trees along the boundary. That Those. we just planted plum yeah. trees. Right now, okay. small plums. And then an, and then a green bush towards the back. But you're proposing a, a red. This red uh, outline is another planting. That's going to be my hydrangea. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and then going back along the shed, you have another uh, shrub. Is that another? Another similar kind yeah. of thing, okay. perhaps a rhododendron that might work there, or or a lilac. And just as a thing to put in, because I know it's not on here, that would then potentially screen your right. solar installation from four and three sunset, right? right? So I guess I just wanted to add that the, the sh I'm familiar with these species that you're speaking of, and um, they're not evergreens for more than half the year. There's going to be no foliage on these shrubs. Um, <laughs> so I think just kind of being aware of kind of the, the purpose of which we're considering these shrubs for them to be screening, they'll be screening for a portion of the year, but not for the entire year. And when we talked to our landscaper about that, um, you know, again, we were hoping for something evergreen, but he just said nothing would um, live. So we were looking at shrubs that would have um, significant woody mass so that, you know, there's at least a structure in the winter time that could do some of the screening. Right, and that's, what I was getting at with the idea of a woody shrub as opposed to a perennial that just will right, die just, back or, yeah. or something smaller. I mean, you know. Um, yes, it's, it would, the intent is to have something right. of a more permanent, not, not an annual nature, or, uh, okay. a woody structure that would grow over time. Okay. Um, well, I think I understand the proposal here. Do any other questions from the board about the landscaping? Um, I wanted to ask a, a follow-up question that I had. If, if my understanding, and this is maybe the best picture in your packet, uh -huh. the edge of the driveway is how far beyond the overhang does the driveway actually go? Is there a... So I'm sorry, right now the driveway ends on the... No, no, I'm sorry, not not, not, well, not where the, the back end of it, but this side here. How far beyond this edge does it extend? I think so about a foot or two feet maybe past okay. this edge. So that, this and, and it's a little vague because I think at one point it probably, it might have been paved, I'm not sure, but right. then it got graveled and the gravel is kind of grassy and it's a hill slope and so... It, it's a little hard to exactly distinguish where the edge of the driveway is, but right. And so your truck is actually sitting off of the driveway in part, it's close to off the driveway. Okay. Yeah. Well, I wanted to explore if there was, you know, right. if one of the conditions was that, in fact, the edge of this existing driveway be defined and and limited, and understanding that it's underneath the oak tree, so you know, either burned up or, um, you know, some curbed. type of landscaping requirement, curbed or, or um, you know, like, like a berm with, with wood chip type of thing to define, to limit something that would impede any parking beyond that. Because that's the whole purpose that you're saying is in part to save this oak tree. You, you don't want people parking off of the, the existing driveway. So if one of the conditions was you have to very much delineate and prevent that from from being expanded. 
while maintaining the air roots, which is something new that I didn't know anything about. These all these roots that are, you know, living on top of the the grass. So like mm -hmm. I thought, oh, can't we just put a bunch of dirt on top of that? And the landscape, you know, the arborists and the landscapers said, no, that will kill the terrain. Right. So there are these all these surface. But I'm talking about either either some curbing or some Something. some type of Something to prevent people from wanting right. to go there. Right. Keeping their keeping their tires to not doing what you're doing with the truck, which is sparking over a bit. Um and again, we're talking about not just you, but successive sure. owners of this property as well. Um, um it's not clear to me exactly the best way to make that delineation um, uh, but I think if we were standing there and looking at it we could say oh you see how that comes down there and maybe we could put some sort of set of rocks along there to make it not you know not inviting for someone to try to drive over or something like that Right. Uh, but yeah, we could we could delineate the edge of the of the of that edge reasonably well, at least for someone who was wanting to pay attention. Um, I don't know if we can make it so that we prevent someone from going there per se without starting to impinge on the roots somehow. Or other, yeah, I mean either either some type of raised significantly raised curbing that. You know, not is not friendly right. <laughs> to tires, um, or yeah, we. You know, I mean, we could lay we could lay rocks, out something. Yeah. I think if we can find the right set of rocks, we can okay. run them down there. I don't know. I guess we could put uh, some sort of timber. You know, sort of a. Well, there's mm -hmm. a stone patio kind of space from up to the left of the. Uh, dry right now, and it would be nice to continue that. And not that somebody wouldn't drive on a stone patio, but it it would tell it would it would make you feel like this is a walking space. This is not a drive you know driving space. It's, right. It's, it's, why? So I'm confused. Are you suggesting making what's now a parking area stone patio, or putting the stone patio on the other side? Because wouldn't that impinge on those air roots? Yeah, not on the other. Yeah, no, not on okay. the other side. But it kind of extending it, um, maybe along the top of it. I don't know. This is the first I've thought about it. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, you know, playing mm -hmm. around with the idea. Well, but. I mean, you know, and and the concern I'm express uh, trying to to touch upon to see, you know, part of it is I don't want to, I don't want to have us to come up with conditions that, you know, are. You cannot meet. You know, sort of a recipe for, for failure, but at the same time, I mean, it is certainly one of my concerns in looking at this is that, you know, if the existing driveway was to be maintained or was to be uh, not dug up, that it be limited so that, you know, as you described, it's a very narrow driveway and that, you know, you don't have this creep. And again, it's not you so much as any successive users um, of this that they have some real limitations on that that particular pull in. So um, I, don't, I don't know if this picture helps at all. So this is like steep down here yeah. and the driveway kind of peters out as you go closer to the tree. So right. you're talking about doing something right along that edge to yep. indicate that that's the edge. Exactly. And 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 really, you know, if we can keep it maybe just make sure you email that to me after. I will. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think that makes sense. I think there was testimony last time from some of the neighbors that in past owners had like squeezed three cars into this. And I think that's what Stan's talking about. You want to right. cut that down so you're not trying to really jam them in and push over. And I mean, in picture one, you can see quite a bit of space between uh, this Hyundai and the truck. So if you're not kind of imagine the truck moving over and like more just kind of two spots and then having the space over there being. Yep. It would be to get three in there, it would definitely be a squish. It would be coming up onto yeah. those roofs. So, kind of clearly preventing that by delineating just the right. two spaces and then right. away from the tree. And with a, you know, a, a better driveway, there won't be 
I mean, I understand what you're, you're trying to prevent future-wise, but certainly we wouldn't be inclined to do that. But yeah, I absolutely. understand. And so no, no, and having some sort of clear boundary of that upper edge of the driveway is should be pretty doable in some fashion that we talked about. Any other questions from the board? I mean, I think those were the only things that we sort of had left over. Claire, did you? Um, I was just a uh, uh, question about um, access permits. When an access permit is granted by Public Works, mm -hmm. um, that access permit has a, um, a width associated with it. Is that correct? Yes. OK. Because um, I'm thinking that's where some of these issues would be addressed, would be within the access permit as far as the the width of the access for the ex yeah that would be for the the, the existing new, one. this would be for the new driveway i don't know if i mean that the existing driveway has probably been there for a very very oh. very long time so i don't know if there was ever an yeah. official access permit for that gotcha. original okay you know it's not even a true curb cut so i i don't i don't know what was issued for that yeah okay anything else yeah. um i did want to mention that one of our neighbors who wasn't here expressed concern about our intent for the property in her email mm -hmm. at, at Four Sunset. Um, and uh, that was based on her understanding that I was going to bring in uh, my, my trailer. There is a trailer there that's actually going to go away. Um, and that I'm storing stuff there. I just wanted to indicate that I am actively in the process of negotiating space uh, over on River Road for parking my trailer as well as storage space for my business mm -hmm. so that I can clear that stuff out from our house. Um, it just, it, I mean, I understand the concern, but I also, just from our own perspective, it would help us in our house to not have to clutter up, mix the two things that residential and Work so. <laughs> so I just wanted to mention that, that okay. hopefully that'll alleviate some level of concern. But. Any, anything else? Um, were any of the neighbors wishing, or any of the parties here? Okay, please come up to a microphone, uh, introduce yourself, and I believe you spoke last time, and so the same instructions that you understand you're still under oath. I, I wanted to let you know that um, I appreciate being able to see this. We appreciate being able to see this. We understand that it's not to scale, but I do want to point out to you, we live directly across the street from where the new proposed driveway would go. And um, our house actually sets a little bit more to the uh, downhill side. So if you look at this driveway that's proposed in this drawing, it doesn't look like it impacts our house, um, but it does. It's just, and I understand this isn't to scale, right. but I want you to understand that it's directly across from the front of our house. And if you right. look at page, uh, map number, you know, picture number 10, you can see where it's uh, where it's going to be, where the impact is going to be on our house. So I have uh, some comments here. Um, we wanted to know what the driveway grade is going to be from the designated parking area and at the street level. We want to know how wide it's going to be coming off the street and where it interacts it intersects with the proposed parking we want to know what the drop-off is going to be on each side of the new proposed driveway and we want to know what the plan for downhill um, runoff from rain and snow melt um, in photos in the photos eight and nine it appears that the proposed area abuts the current driveway and I know you were just talking to Howie about that um, but what I want to know is why can't they use part of their driveway and f as a drive-in towards a proposal that looks like 
this on that I've added on the back page. So they could drive in there and they could have a driveway. They could extend their driveway here in front of the shed out in front of the carport without having to disrupt the leaves. They already drive across there on a pretty regular basis from what we've observed. You did address um, putting something to prevent people from driving and I do appreciate that because that's one of the questions we have is if they start using this as a, a circular driveway, um, who's, who's going to enforce that it wasn't approved as such? And the other question you did, he did mention that he's looking for parking space or, um, you know, property to um, have his business equipment on there. And that's one of the concerns that um, the five neighbors who uh, have signed who signed the original letter on June 5th and as well as have reviewed these notes are concerned about is um, the possibility of equipment being there the last time we met you said that you didn't understand some of the safety issues so I've outlined them if you look at this this bush right here it's an existing bush mm -hmm. It's going to create sight line issues up the street. This proposed bush has the potential to site to um, impact sight lines down the street. There's also a telephone pole right here that's about 14 feet from the edge of the proposed driveway. In any drawings or any information that I found in the proposal, it says it's 20 feet, but we marked it off and it's about 14 feet. It's going to, um, having this driveway, it's going to create another turnaround option on our street. And you, as you know, if you come up Sunset, you have to turn around to go back down. So this is going to create another turnaround option. And I would argue that um, it has uh, the possibility of being somewhat dangerous because of the drop off on the downhill side. Um, the rise in the grade on Sunset is steeper than is depicted in uh, photo number 10. If you look at photo number 10 pretty carefully, it looks like it's just a slight grade, but that's not the case. It's a steep grade, and on, on uh, you know, bad winter days, it does create problems for people, um, and people would have to slow down turn into that driveway and people would have to slow down if they were coming up and there was a problem getting into that driveway. Um, and anybody who's coming out onto the street from the new driveway is going to have to be across the middle of the road because our street isn't very wide. So that's uh, another safety issue. And as we stated in our June 5th letter, um, this proposal is going to create a very tight cluster of three driveways that are just within feet of each other and certainly well, well less than the 45 foot requirement. As far as landscaping is concerned, landscaping is great, but when somebody drives out of the proposed driveway or comes up around out of there, it's going to shine in the um, windows of four sunset it's mm -hmm. going to shine into judy's bedroom at one set and it's going to go right directly into our living room the um they've put uh many truckloads full of ground towards the back of the yard that are that's there now um, we presume that's going to be moved to create the proposed driveway but we want to make sure that if this is approved that it doesn't turn into um, an extension, a driveway extension. You mean um, you mean the gravel? The, where the gravel the is now, we is, would, you know, if this is approved, we would presume that that would need to be seeded over and and uh, with, you know, appropriate grass. Mm -hmm. 
the carport is currently, as Howie states, the carport is currently being used for parking, um, they, for storage. They said that uh, they don't choose to use the carport for parking, but it's not without outside of the realm of possibility. They could. I mean, we have a very narrow carport, and we park our vehicle in there in mm -hmm. the winter. Um, we also back our vehicles into our driveway to mitigate um, any safety issues. Um, and um, bo at both hearings, um, Howie and Allison have said that they uh, consulted a, an arborist or a tree specialist, but we've never seen anything in writing from that person. So if, if, that, if there's no written report, um, we'd like to have um, be able to request a written evaluation from a uh, independent and objective arborist. And um, my last point, I guess, is it's personally from Bob's and my perspective is the fact that um, zoning regulations are there for a purpose, and they're there to so that there's no adverse effect on properties. And we feel that this um, proposal will have an adverse effect on the value of our property because it's putting the driveway right across, right across from us. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, one thing that uh, I will make note of is that you know we are under the um, driveway standards of 3011.i um, that talks about design, construction, and maintenance standards of driveways, including erosion and drainage, off-street parking and loading areas shall be surfaced, graded, drained, and maintained to properly dispose of all surface water and minimize erosion in accordance with the provisions of section 3009. Runoff and eroded surface materials shall not flow onto adjacent streets or properties. And so 3009 are the erosion control standards that any driveway has to meet um, that's constructed in the city of Montpelier. So, you know, but that said, you know, I mean, that's, you know, that there are private rights of action should, you know, water be diverted. That's not what this is, our review necessarily uh, incorporates into. Well, and this is sort of a question for Howie. So my understanding is that, yes, the, the driveway will be built up from where that grade is right now to some extent so that you're not having a massive drop down and that the grade, um, if you look back in the original packet for the rest of the applicants um, with the original plan B, everything here in yellow there's going to be some fill added to decrease what slope you have from the drive from from the road to your property, so it'll be easier to maintain and plant, and de and that also will decrease any amount of drop off on the sides from your driveway. But that in general, your property slopes a bit from this this corner with sorry I'm. Let's see what like three like five and four sunset is maybe your high point that corner and that the property slopes a bit back towards this back corner here right yeah, so erosion runoff would be going behind you it wouldn't be going towards the street so no, much there would be no runoff towards the street right certainly. and and um, you know the the driveway requirements that the public works department has says that we have to have bring the, we can't just drop off from the street. It has to come out somewhat level from the street for right. a certain distance before it starts feathering down. Right. And but that's why all that gravel was there is to be able to do that and then and then to feather out on the side so it's not just a, you know, a raised road. Right. 
Which goes to the October 25th letter from Jacob Miller that was in the original packet. Right. Um, and the fact that Department of Public Works was ready to, they had their conditions and were ready to issue you the access permit when I had to hold it off because of the Development Review Board needing to review, correct? Okay. Okay. Are there any other neighbors that wish to testify or interested parties? Any other questions or comments from the board? Mr. Chair, I, I just for consideration would uh, suggest we consider closing the public hearing and adjourning at the end of our meeting to deliberative session. I, I think that makes a great deal of sense. What's the rest of the board? So, mm -hmm. what we what. I would entertain a motion which would be to close the record and the evidence. We'll take the matter into deliberative session, um, which means that at the end of our regularly scheduled meeting tonight, we have one more application. We'll deliberate about this and um, make a decision that would then come out as a written decision as opposed to what you saw with the last application where we did it and it's a public motion and we have the authority to do that to do those deliberative sessions we often do that when there's a number of moving parts such as this application that way we don't either miss a condition that we're thinking about or a discussion point that we need to resolve as a board so i'll take a motion uh, to close the record and to move this application into deliberative session I'll make the motion based upon my suggestion uh, to uh, close the public hearing and uh, meet again in deliberative session. At the end of this meeting. At the end of this meeting. Okay, motion by Kevin. Do I have a second? Second that motion. Second by Rob. Okay, can I have a quick question? Yes. Which is, what, what are the options for your decisions? In other words, what, sure. what decisions could you come up with? We have a whole range. We could approve it outright without a condition. We could deny it outright without a condition. We could approve it with um, certain conditions that we've discussed tonight. We could approve it with the conditions that we discussed tonight and additional conditions that occur to us in the discussion that we have the legal purview to, to add. Um, that's sort of the waterfront. Yeah, there would be no additional evidence taken in. So anything that hasn't been mentioned or either submitted in writing or discussed in this hearing or the previous hearing, nothing outside of that could be part of the decision unless the hearing got reopened. I, I was just wondering if, if part of, just wondering what the range of conditions <laughs> might set and whether there's a process for dealing with conditions you might set that might not have already been well discussed. I mean we've, we've we've tried to discuss the the range and that's why I've given the board you know an option we've also heard testimony and you know I, what I would say is that you have the range of issues that could rate that could generate conditions if the board is inclined and you know they deal with aesthetics they deal with uh, you know, defining the old driveway and making sure that that is clearly delineated and limited. Um, they deal with some of the questions potentially of safety concerns of, um, you know, how the driveway is to be constructed. Um, you know, those are all potential either conditions that we either feel are satisfied by the application as proposed um, or that we have to impose a condition on. I will also note that we discussed a potential condition last time that could be, because in, in addition to the safety and everything else we're considering, we're looking at a standard as to whether there is an exception to be made for having two driveways instead of one. That's kind of the foundational thing here. So I just will, I will note that one of the potential conditions we discussed last time was swapping out the driveways and closing the existing one in order to create the more versatile new one. So just in the interest of trying to put the, yeah. that, Full yeah. universe okay. on the table. Let's try that one again. Good. Well, thank you all again. Yeah. So we, we had a we had a move. Oh, we didn't have a second or a. No, 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 we did have a second. second. But we Based did have a second. Robbie, sorry, second. I missed all that. those in favor of the motion, please raise your right hand. All 
All right. Close the record and go into deliver session. Now I can say thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Mr. Sheriff, five minutes. Five minutes. Let's take a quick break and then we'll come back with, uh, I believe, VNRC. Yes. Okay. And for this application, I will be recusing myself. Okay. I'll note that uh, just before the break, uh, Vice Chair McCarthy uh, recused herself. And we have conditional use and minor site plan review for 11 Baldwin Street. The applicant is the Vermont Natural Resources Council. If you'll introduce yourself for the record, I'm please. I'm Brian Shoup. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Natural Resources Council. And we're actually co-applicants with the Gibson family, who are the sellers of the property. It's under contract now. OK. Um, and that's that brings me here tonight. And you're the uh, under contract purchasers. We are the potential purchaser. Okay. So let me uh, have you on, put yourself under oath. You solemnly swear or affirm that the evidence and testimony you're about to give for the matter under consideration shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth yes. under pains of penalties of perjury. So why don't you give us an overview of what you're proposing? So we have been located at 9 Bailey Avenue um, since the 1980s. Um, the board at the time had a, had a received a large gift and decided to invest in office space in Montpelier. Um, we've grown since that time. We've made one addition to the building, uh, I think in the late 1990s. Yeah. We've made some internal renovations, but nothing really significant since then. And we're looking at the opportunity when the Gibson property came on the market. We toyed with the idea of looking at it. Um, about a year later, we toyed with it again and, and um, up in, uh, um and subsequently made an offer about a month, a month and a half ago to, um, as a way to explore whether it would provide larger office space or annex space um, for us. We're, we're still at this point, if we were to purchase the building and renovate it, um, uh, we're not sure whether it would be used in conjunction with our existing building or as we would turn that building, you know, sell that building, which is what right. we would likely do. We don't have a lot of money we do have an opportunity that is kind of unique to us so we're just looking at pretty straightforward the building hasn't been renovated much it's had some roof improvements and some stair improvements um it's it's um a pretty significant project um it is the only single family dwelling on that street it's the only um it's one of two residential uh, dwellings on the street, the apartments on the corner of Bailey and Baldwin. Excuse me. Yep. Oh, just in case the general microphone is um, owned by Downstreet Housing. That's our neighbor. Um, everything else along the street is office buildings. The biggest site constraint to the building is parking, and that was raised in the um, staff report. Um, we're very aware of that. What we're hoping to accomplish is to um, determine whether it meets the minimum requirements of the city for renovation. And if we were to move forward with the purchase and the renovation of the building, our plan is to explore additional options, um, including some minor ledge removal, which would provide more space in the existing parking area. And the lot does go through to Terrace Street. Um, and I know there's at least one other building on Baldwin that has gotten um, satellite parking up on Terrace on mm -hmm. the back part right. of their lot. That's another option we'd like to explore. Frankly, I mean, and I've been an RDRB in Waitsfield for about 15 years, and I understand the applicants problems aren't your problems, and I don't intend to make them yours, but um, we're under a pretty tight time frame, and there's a lot of expenses and, and the design for those other parking alternatives. So we, um, if we were to move forward, we're going to explore those, but we're not able to provide any evidence or design tonight that we can meet any additional parking standards other than what we proposed, with some minor variations. And I have some handouts that are based on the staff report and my conversation with Meredith earlier in, um, last week. Okay. Um, so in a nutshell, I, should I just hand out what I, I have? I want to hand out, um, do you want me just to, do you have specific things or do you want me just to continue kind of No, I think the narrative is helpful. Okay. Um, I mean, obviously parking is the key here, um, but let's. So, um, 
I have two pictures of neighboring properties, the one at the corner of Baldwin and Bailey, which was recently rehabbed, and the one next door at 9 Baldwin, just to provide you with the kind of concept that we're looking to replicate with having parallel parking in the driveway by widening the driveway. Um, and that's, that's really exactly what we're hoping to do. I also have a, um, a revised site plan. Uh, the zoning administrator mentioned that landscaping would be a question tonight, snow removal would be a question, and to, I can give them some additional thought to how parking could be configured a little bit better than what is on that plan. So I want to show you that as well. And then finally, I'm familiar with the um, provision of the zoning that allows you to uh, grant waivers for parking under certain circumstances. And I just wanted to provide a uh, Google map that shows the context of the building relative to transit on street parking and other um, um, in other facilities in the area. So perhaps starting with the revised site plan, um, what was given to you shows adding on to the existing parking area with two lower parking air, parking spaces on the right. Um, it actually makes more sense to extend that increased parking up further, and that's the area that I highlighted in green. Mm -hmm. And that'll do a couple of things. One, it'll ease the little bit of a bottleneck between the um, um, parking area up in front of the garage, and it will make sure that at least one space that's 18 and a half feet long can be um, within the uh, uh, building line of the building. It won't be in front of it. Um, I wasn't under. I didn't understand in the zoning whether parking was prohibited in the um, in front of the building line. I thought it was prohibited in the front setback. So that's a question that I have: is it is it is it not counted towards the total, or is it prohibited? Uh, so you are are not supposed to have parking areas between the front line of the building and the front property line, with the exception of residential, that residence, residential driveways may be parked in. So since this is going to be commercial, my understanding is you cannot have vehicles, vehicle parking areas between the front line of the building and the, and the road. <laughs> Okay. Um, <laughs> right, right. Those, those, we, those uh, my, no, these are businesses. That's all. Well, I know these the one that's current, business. Uh, that one's, yeah, that one's Baldwin. Yeah. Uh, the corners so of that one can happen, but this one, the square building, that's not residential, correct? That's an office? No, that's state. Yeah. We, it, but the thing is, state, it's a state building. We don't do anything with that. They don't, if it's, if it's state property, does it it, they don't become, come to us. Does it automatically become part of the capital district? If, if well, it has to be it? within. No, it has to be within technically the capital complex. Yeah, that's right. But yeah. Right. So yeah, we would still have regulatory authority. Uh, it depends yeah. on what you're talking about and who's talking about it. There's a debate. Most Which of the has been capital going on since the year one. Right. Anyway, the the uh, this is this is the first property where I have dealt with since I've been here where something within the capital complex has come forward for an application at all. I've had things come up where the state is starting to do something on their site plan. And luckily I have been able to find a way under 4413 to say we have no authority over it. So I'm not gonna push to have you come in. If the state starts doing something that, you know, falls within that allowable zoning regulations under 4413, I'm probably going to have a fight on my hands to get them to come in with an application. So I, okay. I, I'm well, just... this is in the state property. Yeah, this so is in state property, so we don't have not, to... But, but my whole point was that, that, you know, we haven't... Something like this on private property, we wouldn't allow right now on private property commercial. Or I should say non-residential. I, I don't believe there's the, um, I guess would be, I'm not sure about this. I don't believe there's a 36 feet um, that would allow for two spaces then, but there's definitely with expanding the parking in that green highlighted area is the potential for a space. My understanding is also that you allow stack parking. Um, 
up to two is my understanding. It, it's actually for commercial. It should it, the phrase is tandem, and it's defined in the language as you know one parking behind another. So you can block in one other car. Um, a, another feature on this map I want to point out is the area highlighted in yellow. That's the area between the um, existing end of pavement and. Uh, um, in the area that's relatively flat before it starts to go up the grade, up the hill. Mm -hmm. um, it's about 12, 13 feet, and, there's, and, there, and that extends all the way behind the garage, um, mm -hmm. which I, I concluded today is maybe a potential other parking space, but what's more importantly, um, I feel like that's adequate uh, area for snow storage. Mm -hmm. um, it, it doesn't start to go uphill for, like I said, about 12 to 13 feet. Um, snow can be pushed behind the garage. So that's that's one of the issues that I saw on the staff report that was um, an area of interest in the, of the board. Um, and then finally, the fourth thing that I passed out was with regard to transit. We are within a thousand feet of the transit shop stop on um, State Street, the Burlington Link, and also the Capitol shuttle, uh, the circulator stops right down the street at um, the Capitol within a thousand feet. So those are the two transit stops and the significance of the shuttle is there is satellite parking at the Department of Labor that would allow people to park there um, and, and um, either walk in or ride the shuttle. Um, I also, I just wanted to, to make uh, one comment with regard to the staff report um, I believe it was attributed to Public Works that um, walking or biking is seasonal um, and it's not necessarily. We have some pretty hardcore folks, who, one of which recused herself from this meeting, um, who walk and during all, you know, all elements and all seasons. Um, and we are, we, as recently, and this was kind of unrelated to this, last week one of our staff members attended a uh, workshop at Local Motion in Burlington regarding alternative commuting. And we will have um, interior bike storage. We will have at least one shower. Um, and we are putting in programs. We will put in programs that, um, you know, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the final program is going to look like, but it is a um, incentive programs to encourage people to not drive a single occupancy vehicle to work. Um, we have folks who live up in the Burlington um, uh, Winooski, Williston area who take the link to work. Um, we have four staff members uh, or five staff members who walk or bike at least some time to work, um, some more often than others, and there is the possibility of having um, uh, a lot of our staff members walk to work. Others um, carpool. So, Brian, are, are we, am I reading this correctly in that right now, short of any waiver of parking, it's a five car requirement given the square footage of the space? That's what, that's what I was told. I initially thought um, from an earlier conversation, thought it was three spaces, but that was corrected. Okay. And is the garage usable? Yes, it's, okay. it's a garage. Um, uh, it, it, and just with the, with, I just want to say one other thing about kind of demand management for parking. Um, we do lease a vehicle, um, and we do that for two reasons. One, frankly, it's it's cheaper than reimbursing staff for using their own vehicles by just paying for the gas and leasing the vehicle. It's quite a bit cheaper, um, but more as equally important, it it allows for and encourages staff to be one car families. Uh, a couple of our staff are by having them not have to depend on their own car for work all the time. So that's just a, another measure we put in place. I mean, my concern is, I mean, you know Baldwin Street. It's crowded, um, especially when the legislature is in session. Yeah. But I mean, I've been when the legislature is out of session, and it's not that much better. Um, Baldwin is always filled. Yeah. Um, you know, first come, first serve in the morning. Um, um, Redstone, the street up to Redstone, usually has spaces when the legislature is not in session. I park there a lot um, for various reasons. 
my one concern about off-street parking is that this is just sort of a, and we've we've had applications as you've noted on Terrace Street and you know there's a lot of concern about the fact that you know this is a, a high demand on-street parking area um, and that would be just simply one of my concerns um, about any type of waiver that this is not a, a downtown in the same sense as a commercial space that just really doesn't have any parking um, that my concern would be is as much as DNRC may be dedicated to you know has employing hardy walkers and bikers and transit users that if the building is sold to somebody else who's not maybe the oil and gas industry decide to occupy the spaces there um, you know that that could that that might not have the same um, dedication, but I'm looking at your and your drawing the C1.01, and are each of these rectangles essentially one car? A space for one. Car, yeah, yes. space for one. So we've got one, two, three, and four, and then the the fifth one is this one that we really can't allow because it goes beyond the front of the building. Um, but it also doesn't include the garage either, yeah. does? Uh, so these both go in beyond the front of the building. Right? Well, I, so I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily interpret that with a little tail end to go beyond the building, that it would somehow uh, be inclusive of vehicle overhang. Hmm. I don't know. That was my. You guys, I, I know I'm. I know I'm being really strict here. That's sort of my job. Um, where was it? Uh, so, 3011, locational standards 3011G. Uh, so, and of course, I have it in my staff report. Yeah, I see. It's um, G2, parking yeah. and loading areas, parentheses, inclusive of vehicle overhang. Right. So I... Shall be located behind the front I don't know if you building. can count either of those first two parking spaces. Well, and certainly if they bump into that green area... Right. Then you get one, two, three, four, counting the garage. It's a little confusing because I super... I, the green area was not... If you look at the... Um, so the line to the, you can see the existing um, parking uh, driveway configuration is the thinner line mm -hmm. and the larger line. I believe if it were to be extended up to that octagonal area, which is basically, it was not a landscape designer, but somebody, we wanted to show landscaping and that's a large lilac hedge. And that lilac hedge is, is located on some ledgy ground, mm -hmm. um, but there's room to have to, without really much site work at all, to put the pavement all the way up to the edge. Mm -hmm. You could have one one space on the right, and then the way that this other space is shown, you could have two parallel spaces. They would be stacked, and I understand. I mean, I'm, I understand the practical challenges of that. We do stack parking from time to time now. Um, but I believe you could you could fit two spaces between side by side next to that green area. What's the total number of uh, folks you have on on the uh, property at any one time? Thirteen, uh, including one part-time person who's there two days a week. Okay, so that's just the staff. Yes, that's your staff. Yes, and then they're during any other any particular day. Meetings. Um, yeah, we we have people come by by appointment uh, meetings, and they they park wherever they can. Or, yeah, same as you do for anybody else in that neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the minimum the minimum parking requirements are now based on square footage of the use. So. Even with that many staff, it's still five no, no, I parking spaces. That. Okay. Oh, yep. Nope. It doesn't. Uh, Agreed. And up on Terrace Street, is is that um, 
workable site to put? Yeah, you would need to um, um, put in fill, bring in yeah. a, a, a retaining wall. Um, it's, it's not 30% grade, um, but I, I would need to be engineered. I mean, I wouldn't just right. have a contractor come and do it. I'd want to make sure that it was safe and stable and drainage was taken. Sure, so you wouldn't have a car come crashing into the lilac bush from above. Good. Um, I mean, I think you have a couple of different options here The around the back, um, the highlighted yellow, the... Um, the green as well as the Terrace Street could all get you to five, um, even with our somewhat draconian um, no overhang in front of the building uh, rules. So I, I, I think, and I think five is reasonable given how big your staff is knowing that some will not need this but at the same time you know between between staff visitors meetings yeah i hope we get to the point where we won't need five but i understand where we are now right not there i mean it'd be great if we had jetpacks too uh, <laughs> but you know um i just think that that's given what we're and we're always wrestling with parking here in the city, and but in this in this neighborhood in particular, I think it's because it's so close to so many. Well, this is the last residential or one of the last residentials on this street, up above on Terrace Street. It gets very residential, yep. and I know there's been a lot of uh, push and pull because of the spillover and state government and commercial use uh, of the streets. Um, I know that you have permitted one space for a Baldwin Street property, and also I haven't wanted right. to go down there yet because um, you know, I need to talk to neighbors. And, and and frankly, if you wanted to build like a, one parking space up on Terrace Street, I think that's a workable option, and certainly what we've approved before. Um, and our concern then was just simply circulation, but uh, you know how the how the pedestrian was to get from up or up on Terrace Street down to Baldwin. But I think that they've proven that they've that I haven't heard of any um, difficulties. You know, we talked about a, a, a staircase or something, mm -hmm. and frankly, it's there's a sidewalk that goes right around the block. Exactly. I mean, I think that's what the that's what the other the Baldwin Street property that uses that. Um, so, given that, um, were there any other questions from any other board members? I mean, I'm just one board member talking about the five, but that just. Mm. So, so I haven't located, just so, I'm sorry. Um, I haven't located the one pin up there is another concern. Mm -hmm. Based on the site plan I've seen, there's there would be room without in, yeah. encroaching into, actually, I, I would need to know what the setback is, but um, there would be room for two eight and a half feet wide spaces at least. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's room for three. Um, because of the structure that would be involved, but there's room right to it. You know, I think if you did that and and then you had three spaces down below, even if two two of them were sort of uh, stacked, um, I think that that's more than sufficient. I mean, I'm not looking to impose, <laughs> nor could I impose additional parking, but I think meeting the minimum in a case like this is uh, is important and certainly the upper terrace street is an option um, the highlighted yellow seems to be workable as well you mentioned before that the yellow might be the best spot for snow storage mm -hmm. in, in the winter and, and that's certainly you know an important consideration I mean if you did not have an on-site uh, snow storage location I, you know I don't know how you deal with the the, the Bailey, um, if that's if you have an on-site storage or if you have to truck it off at certain points, I, I, occasionally but not often. Yeah. It usually goes over the bank and fortunately doesn't go all the way down into the Union Mutual parking lot. Uh, um, 
Can I throw it? I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm going to throw another potential wrench in just because I'm not quite sure um, on the your what is it hexagon <laughs> um, that you said was the large lilac. Is that area that you've marked off there all the multiple places where the shoots come up, or that's sort of the growing area that it needs? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? So under the landscaping regulations that we have now, every tree and shrub has its own individual minimum um, planting area to allow the roots to stay healthy. So I'm not, I'm, we haven't really gotten to the landscaping mm -hmm. discussion, but it is a question of if, for where that green possible pavement moving forward is, that lilac, we have to make sure it retains enough growing area. I don't think that's a problem, but it would be something you would need to have make probably a determination on it. Yeah, point. I mean, we can make a determination, but I also yep. don't think it's, I mean, I don't think it's uh, topographically speaking, if the lilac bed is above at a certain level, we can get yeah. much closer because it's not as if the lilacs need root space into the air. I'm trying to remember what... <laughs> yeah, the, the green highlighted area is lawn. Great. And, and uh, it's, you know, it has the same grade as the driveway, just a gentle slope up. And then when it hits pretty much the edge of that, that shape, um, it rises up. It, it mm -hmm. gets ledgy. No, but I can see the, the it's one foot contours um, is what you have on here right now. Um, and I have no idea how many lilacs are in there. They've okay. probably been there for decades, and they're doing pretty well. Okay. No no worries. It was just also getting sort of on the record what you've, a general sense of what you've got there. Um, well, so I'll just point out. I'm not, I'm not, I guess I'm not clear, even, is there, are there four spaces on site that you can accommodate, not including a space between the road and the front of the building? Yes. Okay. Because you were just saying three plus one up on Baldwin. Oh, I, I know, I, I was, when he was saying two up on Baldwin, I said, yeah. if you did two up on Baldwin, then at least three down below. Okay. Yep. But however I mean, I, the, so the, one, I'll just, the, the, Calculations. I mean, the regulations do say that you always round up. It's 4.43 mm -hmm. if you divide 2660 by the 600 square feet. So if you didn't, if we weren't required to round up, you would otherwise round down to four. Um, yep, but I, I know, I know, no, I know. I know the regulations, yeah. that's what we do. We round up. But then there's also these specific provisions which says we can waive some or all of the parking. So we could waive all parking requirements um, if we wanted to. To the extent that, and there's you know factors mm -hmm. listed, and and I think there's been clear evidence that multiple of those are addressed here. There is um, public transit. There's multiple public tra transit stops serving both Montpelier as well as you know Burlington and between within a quarter mile. Um, there's been testimony that there will be secure enclosed bicycle storage and shower facilities. Um, adequate on-street or public parking. Um, seasonally, there's been representation that the streets in the neighborhood provide those opportunities uh, at least part of the year. Um, so I think, I mean, it's it's like if there's any case where there's uh, it's appropriate to waive some of the requirements, this seems to be a good case given the um, representations and the evidence that's been provided. So. And given the fact that, you know, again, it's based on the square footage, it's less than half above four, um, then we're rounding up to five. So as one board member, if there's on-site space for four spaces, and given the representations on some of the factors that would justify waiver, I would be comfortable waiving the requirement of, of that fifth space and just having uh, the four on-site spaces as one member. I would I would agree with with what you're saying. I think that this is this is the case in which these parking waivers make sense to be applied and that it'll be kind of dictated based on keeping their employees happy <laughs> with how they manage their parking. Um, so I, I would agree with you. Yep. I mean that's an interesting thing if it's just, if uh, 
part of the justification for the waiver is that you have to do these things. You know, you have to provide enclosed bicycle storage and shower facilities. Presumably, if another office, if this, if another office use came in and took over the existing permit, they would be bound by the same conditions. They couldn't say eliminate the bike storage and eliminate the shower. Without. No, but you know, my concern would be that they would then, you know, that the the impact of parking when you grant these type of waivers is, you know, I understand that to a certain extent that the testimony about the lack of cars means, oh, we don't have that big of an impact. But the fact of the matter is if there is a larger impact, if people do drive, um, the neighborhood bears that. And but I think in the, the times of year when there's a real issue with parking, the neighborhood bears it to the full extent anyway. And I don't think having VNRC, uh, who's represented that they're at least meet some of the factors which would entitle them to a waiver, is uh, you know that one space on VNRC's law is going to have any I mean, real impact. That's one board member. Okay. No, I mean, I, I'm just saying. Um, I would actually almost make the argument that if there's four spaces instead of five, it drives a more of a culture to uh, use other modes of transportation to uh, to get get to work, and uh, you know could could even do the opposite. <laughs> I, I I think it I think it just depends. I mean, you know, in we all have our experiences, but you know, I mean, every when people drive for whatever reason they drive they bring a car into that and you bring 13 people in and you can provide shower space and you can provide um, bike storage space but if people need to drive for whatever particular reason it has that impact um, and in a neighborhood is I, I mean that that's my sense is that this is a neighborhood that that doesn't need because this is a new, it, we're not talking about taking an existing commercial use. We're talking about taking a residential use and expanding it into a commercial use. You know, there aren't 13 people coming in and out of this building every day right now. But it's also, I mean, this is the last single family residence on the street. I don't think, it's, I think the character of the area is, uh, is office uses. Um, I don't think it's realistic given the changes to the neighborhood since this was residential however long ago that you can really say um, it, it doesn't make sense to treat it just as any other single family residence to me anyway well yeah I mean not, not any changing it to an office space fits very well with the character of the area and so I think if oh, you I think about it as an office space then the four to five spa parking space kind of consideration uh, isn't as meaningful as if you think about it as you're taking oh, a, a pre-existing single-family residence, which have probably, you know, much less parking needs, and converting into an office. I know that's what we're doing, but that, that is exactly I know. But I think it's, it's, I'm saying it's like the office use fits very well with the character of the area. So I think the office use fits very well with the character of the area, given that there was other office uses. I'm just, I mean, I think we're looking at this very narrow issue about parking, um, but. You know that may simply be a ball that lies where it's been hit. Um, I just a thought. It's something I noted in here is that you know yes, we're dealing with the parking on this site and VNRC's um, you know presentation of we're going to do all these things. We we currently don't have a lot of people as many people coming and driving individual vehicles as we have employees we're planning to keep that and maybe even encourage more alternative transportation use and they're just shifting their you know on site uh, on street parking impact from their current parcel to the new parcel as long as the use doesn't change in the property that they're in now if they happen to sell that property somebody else could come in there and have even more employees, potentially, I know it's not necessarily going to fit, but or even have the same number of employees with more people driving, and there's nothing we can do about that. Yeah, but and they have the current expansion you know, of the other... Uh, mm, it doesn't have to be expansion. I know. No, well, I'm saying you're, you're hypothesizing that there could be more cars coming. 
the, the old VNRC. Right, building. which is, I think, part of what Tom's concerns were, is that you're potentially adding quite a bit more traffic to this street. You know, not just traffic, but need for parking. And it's not, so just, just to make sure we're, you know, we're not right. talking about one more car parking on the street necessarily. No. I mean, okay. Tom McArdle's point on this is there's only a limited amount of, um, of available on-street parking in this area with demand typically exceeding supply, which is consistent with what Brian stated, especially during the legislative season. Additional office use without adequate parking accommodation will create additional demand for on-street parking in the surrounding neighborhoods, which currently stresses municipal services to manage. Considering that walking and biking are largely weather and proximity dependent alternative transportation with secure offsite, parking should be considered for the life of the permit. Um, and that's just, I mean, I think that's, I, I think the fifth spot, I mean, the, I don't think with much effort the applicant would, it would take to get the applicant up to five is the other thing. I mean, this isn't a situation where, like, we're dealing with the first application tonight where there's, there's, an, there's another space. I fully get that, the, that you know, their impact may be lower and, and that, um, you know, in that, in, case, in that case, that's great. You'll have plenty of parking for when you have big meetings. Um, but I think the five, you know, setting this out so that it has five spaces, however we get to that number, whether it's up on Terrace Street or reconfiguring within that green area or that uh, highlighted area. I think it's consistent with what Tom McArdle is saying, but also my sense of the neighborhood as well. Um, and fits within the idea that, you know, they're going to, the, they're, they're a big office, 13 people is a lot of people, and, you know, their success in making that work without having an oversized impact to the area, it, you know, is the success of the alternative transportations. So let's, um, let's move on beyond the parking. Um, and we'll come back to that when we talk about how we want to treat this application. Um, so Brian, the bicycle storage, where is that going to be? We have designed the. We're we're. I just want to know whether it's it's an office space is a permittable use, and then there's a lot of work to do. Right. The um, the inside, it, it's it's a fairly. Um, it hasn't seen many updates uh, inside the building in quite a long time, um, so it's really we don't have a program for it yet. We're laying out offices. New walls will go up. Some walls will go down. Um, there's a large entryway, which is currently a kitchen, which has, is very flexible. There's a butler's pantry, there's a washroom, there's plenty of space in there for secured um, interior bike storage. We really don't have a formal area in our, in our current office. We are putting, um, we're looking into covered bike racks on the porch. People do bring their bike into the, to our, our building now. I would want to formalize it to where it's easy and out of the way. And, but we don't have a floor plan yet. Right. Okay. Um, well, I mean, I, I don't get the sense from any of us that there's an objection to this as office space. I think it can work. I think it's, we're getting, you know, bogged down in, in some of the parking spaces, which is what DRBs naturally do. No, I know. And, and I, I admit that um, there are some ideas that are not fully formed now that I think have a lot of potential, but I don't, right. I can't provide you with the information to, to go. Well, so, I mean, would you, do you think it makes sense f for us to just continue to go through and, and give you our feedback and with the idea that we would table this and then you'd come back with some more specifics? Um, or how, how do you want us to, what would I, you like I, to, us I to give you I guess if any other um, areas of concern would be yeah. helpful. I, I will say, um, yeah. And I'm just, I'm, I'm not saying this to kind of, um, again, it's my problem, it's not your problem. Um, I don't, you know, we have a tight timeline to get things done. And if there's, it, I'll have to right. seek an extension and I'll, you know, we'll do that. A contract extension. Oh, contract. One of the, one of the, um, the um, 
conditions of our contract was a change of use permit, recognizing that we're going to have the building permit. We feel comfortable we're going to be able to get at that time. Right. So the the contract is that you have to have that change of use permit in hand. Yes. But but I, I've I've sought one extension and can seek another one. Right. I mean I. I I don't see this coming out with you not getting that change of use, um, just based on the feedback that we're getting from other board members, uh, as well as my own impression as one board member, that this is a consistent use with this neighborhood and that there's plenty of options here. And, you know, if the majority of the board said four spaces, then it would work even easier than <laughs> if, uh, if they say five spaces. Um, but. But even if they said five spaces, it looks like you have, I think you have the space. It's not a, a, an impossibility where we'd have to bend the bend things to make it, it, it sort of fit. I think this is easily adaptable. Um, so the other, one of the other staff comments that you may have seen was just pedestrian circulation. You know, is this something where people are going to come down the driveway up the front door or would there be sort of a, a right in that back? Corner area where the kitchen is and the porch. Uh, the that, that's the main. It, that is that's currently the main, the main functional interest entrance, right. and I accept expect that it would continue to be. Okay. Um, I don't recall the Gibsons ever shoveling the front steps in the time that I've been at VNRC, and I don't know that we ever would do that either. We would encourage people to go to the side door. Okay. So it would it would be essentially directed. And one of the reasons is that would be the handicapped access, um, and. Um, that space with the BCP, I don't think it relates to the space, is intended as handicapped access. Um, the dimensions of that area allow for it. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, one of the questions we have is whether the kitchen door or the door to the um, um, sun porch, which is that extension to the right, mm -hmm. uh, would be the ADA access. And there's there's internal reasons, door widths, and and some grade issues that all will determine that. But the architect we worked with has said an ADA access is possible in that area. Okay. And my understanding, Meredith, correct me if I'm wrong, is that this doesn't trigger ADA parking requirements, does it? This this um, um. application. No, that they because it's a commercial use, they have to have at least one spot. I think okay. is what I said in here. Sorry, I was thinking about something else while you were talking. So it is one. It is one spot that yeah. they have to have. That's ADA, and so then also a, an entrance that's ADA accessible. As well. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. if the if the parking spaces will be actually painted, then they have to have at least one accessible space, ADA accessible space. Whether it's required or not, we feel as though we would yeah. need to provide accessibility. And I mean, technically, because there, it would be less than ten parking spaces. They don't have to provide. Right. They don't have to stripe. So therefore, they don't have, they don't have, to, have right. to have the AD accessible spot. But if they're going to stripe them, even right. if it's less than ten, they've got to have that. Okay. And they want to anyway, so right. it should be marked. Yeah, that should ultimately be marked in in any sort of final outline. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I'm just thinking out loud too as you finalize your internal layout plan. I mean, I've, I expect that these uh, square footage areas on here between office and then storage slash unfinished with 2660 being office and 1140 square feet. Um, I don't know how fixed in stone those are. I, I'm glad you brought that up, and that is that is an area that I'm a little concerned about. That um, there's some, a lot of unheated space that at this point we're not looking at moving into. Mm -hmm. um, the third floor is, is a little bit of a question mark. Um, so I went with what was what was immediate, and the idea being, I, I by the time we do a building plan, in um, evaluate other additional parking options, I would come back and say, here's more space, we, we finalized the square footage. Right. Yeah, so that's an option going forward if you want to say, 
we're only going to seek a permit to use 2,400 square feet of office space, then you only need to demonstrate four parking spaces. Or if you even came in and just said, we're going to start off with 1,800 square feet of finished office space, you buy three parking spaces. As you say, then you want to come back and say, we're going to add more office space, we'll add another spot then. I really couldn't in good faith scale it back too much because mm -hmm. we need the space. Yeah. And, and a lot of the space, our biggest space, yeah. So I, I, I hear you. Right. Um, I'm sorry, I it's getting late and I had a bit of a brainstorm that okay. may help us out here and might help Brian out. And I know I'm the one who's supposed to have the procedural answers, but maybe somebody else will, will back me up on this. Is it possible for the board tonight to just provide conditional use approval conditioned on the fact that no site plan changes will be made, you know, and limit the number of actual parking places that are here and that any actual use of the building, the applicant will need to come back before the board for the minor site plan approval versus having the minor site plan go through me so that you can still have another look at the parking. Yeah, I mean, you were talking about bifurcating yeah. and essentially, you know, because that gets to actually what Ryan was asking about, which is that we could give a sort of conditional use approval based on sort of the existing parking, which would be three spaces that, um, as it as it currently exists, um, right? Which could with with the understanding that any internal changes would require the minor site plan review. Uh, Brian, I don't know if that helps you get further down the road of what you need. Well, and that also, you know, I have a suggested motion condition here that limits the office use to 1,800 square feet within the building without getting further site plan approval. The 1,800 yes. square feet matches up with the three parking spaces. So yeah. they could use up to 1,800 square feet of the building for office space without requiring additional so, site plan approval. So in that, in that respect, what you could walk out with tonight would be the conditional use approval for the uh, changing it to office space um, on the sort of limited square footage with the understanding that your plans ultimately are to expand, and then the minor site plan review would take care of that. Um, because they are somewhat separate and that our minor site plan review would be looking at the, the traffic issues and the, the the larger impact that the expanded use would would contain that way i don't know if that means you wouldn't have to seek an extension or you'd be able to move faster on that or if you would want you would really want the entire sort of footprint before you went forward with your contract well, I mean, obviously, that would be the most desirable thing from my standpoint. But I, I'm, I'm also recognizing, you know, where the bind you're in, you have regulations to apply. I mean, it, 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 that kind of, I then have to decide to take a little bit of a leap of faith. I appreciate the feedback I've gotten, and it seems as though the board is is willing to be as flexible as possible within the confines of the bylaw mm -hmm. to allow us to figure things out and I, I, I appreciate that feel good about that um, you know my experience is board sometimes change so I, I guess I probably want to act fast we're, we're pretty stable I think we just had a renewal so you don't you won't get a new cast of characters in a, in a, in a month or so and I, I think really I mean at least I mean unless your timetable is different you know the big thing is going to be Sort of figuring out how you, which way you want to go on the traffic, on the uh, the parking. Yeah. And I think once you once you have that, that's a matter of a meeting. So if it was a matter of, I mean that's the other that's the other sort of side of the coin is that, you know, if you just wanted to sort of table based on the feedback you'd get from us tonight, and come back in two weeks uh, on August fifth. Yeah. Just to note that any parking up off of Terrace, you're going to also have to look at new curb cut. And it's, it just brings in some new factors as right. adding a new curb cut and needing to meet your, you know, look at those driveway dimensions and more data. It, and I haven't looked into that. Is, is backing onto a street prohibited? No. Nope. Okay. That's it's fine. It's just, you know, it's one of those things where we're going to look at 
sight lines and adding adding a second it's additional sort of exemptions yeah. where you know the board has to give you some level of exemption for having two curb cuts on one property and then looking at your spacing they might have to give you like earlier this evening give you an ex an exemption from the spacing minimums and department of public works is going to want to look at that again to make sure they're okay with whatever second curb cut you proposed so it's just it's more information gathering yeah. in the next two weeks but it's not it's not necessarily an issue I have a question about the access permits. It would have to get a, a new well new revised access. Well, so the, it, it's two two layers of approval. The, the DRB would need to approve the fact that it will have two access points, as well as r potentially reduced spacing between the new curb cut and whatever other driveways are up there. I'm assuming that there's lots of driveways in, right in that area. And then in addition to that, before they actually develop that, they would need an access permit from the Department of Public Works. I'm just, I'm just wanting to make sure that if there is an approval granted by the DRB, that then the subsequent access permit that would be sought by the Department of Public Works wouldn't then have the effect of needing to then change well, no, something no, and come as back. That's what, normally what you do is you have, I mean, I would, we would have Department of Public Works look at that proposed new access. We would need to have it early enough to have that work, or if it changes, it would have to come back to the DRB. Okay. Right. right. You know, you, you condition it on the Department of Public Works approving the access point as approved by the DRB. Does that make sense? Right. If the, I, I, was, I was thinking kind of in the interest of kind of keeping it um, uh, more clearer about what we're approving is that if we were to say come back in two weeks have the defined area that's already been signed off by DPW it, it's just going to create a clearer path for an approval that's yeah, I just can't. I just can't guarantee that right. DPW. You know, it depends on when I get the information and when DPW has right. the ability to review it, yeah. type of deal. And I'm, you know, and getting it back in time from for our office to. Yeah. Okay, well, let's. Uh, I just want to touch upon two other points real quickly. Um, my understanding is that there's no proposed changes to the landscaping. Um, Actually, it's it's a little bit rudimentary. I did. The front yard is somewhat barren, so I did propose the two black dots would be street trees, red oaks. Uh, I, you know, I don't oh, know okay. where we're going to likely have to replace a water line for sprinkler. I don't know where the utilities are, um, so that that hasn't been determined. So um, I really spaced those two trees to frame the front of the building, provide shade, provide a little bit of sidewalk cover, yeah. and they're they're intended to be spaced the same distance from the sidewalk as two crab apples at 13 Baldwin Street, just to kind of have a consistent street tree line. Um, but that's the only new landscaping. Everything else is, is shown. Yeah, one thing I noticed, at least from especially the aerial photographs, you can see this is fairly well um, forested. Mm -hmm. Um, the backyard all the way up to terrace is, is right. he wooded. heavily wooded yeah. and, and you know and and there's landscaping around the front of the building although it's you know sort of low key a lot of, it's a pretty it's well established foundation yep shrubbery so I, I wouldn't see, I mean certainly the the two trees are are fine but I wouldn't see a need to put on any additional conditions for landscaping um, and then the other issue is the whether this would have an undue a adverse impact on traffic is w one of the questions that I th we do have to, for conditional use, confront. Um, I don't get the sense that these, I think parking's the bigger issue, the traffic is on this street what it is, and that these, you know, the. I'm sure at certain times of the day it can get a little bit snarl as people come into work and out of work yeah when the legislature goes home there's a stream but um, right. you know it's really not a very it's not that busy a street and right. frankly we walk to the state house our staff several times a day during session we often walk down the middle of the street it's pretty common and it's not a, a through street so you don't get no and it's one way at aiken right which, which limits it 
So I, I don't see any any reason for additional studies or that this finding of undue and adverse in effect on traffic. So with those, really the question for us, and Brian, I'll, I think really the question for you is, do you want us to give you this sort of bifurcated conditional use approval for the office um, with the idea that you'll come back for the minor site plan review with this, with the additional information based on what we discussed tonight on on parking and where snow storage would be, um, or do you do you want to wait for the whole thing? Um, you know, I guess I I'd take it one step at a time. If you wanted to do the bifurcated approach, then yeah. you're fine. I, I, I'm curious what level of detail would be required for. Um, parking spaces off terrace. I mean, if, if I were a neighbor, I would want to know what the retaining wall is going to look like, whether any landscaping is necessary there to, to screen it. So that's that's a question I have. I, I guess I just answered my own question that I, I would expect a reasonable level of detail so everybody right. knows what to see. Yeah, well, and also, yes. I mean, you're on, th that is, it's not 30% or higher slopes, but it is 20% or yes. more slopes back there. So I think some detail on the retaining wall may be necessary. Um, so, I mean, you could, if you don't think you can get that in two weeks, we could also table uh, it for four if, okay. if you needed it. I know you're on a schedule. And, and it, may, it may be that I, I take that leap of faith and yeah. go with this and come back get a later with, day. With the bifurcated approach, yeah. you're not losing anything. No. You, know, you, you yeah. may not have any positive effect, but, it, but, it's, but it's not going to have any negative effect. True. Yes. Okay. Cool. Just checking. Because at least the, the drawing that we have. Is I'm, I'm good. Okay. All right. So I'll entertain a motion from the board based on that. Somebody want to frame it? Sure. I'll make a motion uh, to approve the change of use uh, at 11 Baldwin Street from a single family residential use to an office use um, as a conditional use with the condition that I. Future site plan will come before the Development Review Board uh, to review additional parking, which is required uh, for any office use of the building in excess of 1,800 square feet, which is approved now based on the existing three parking spaces. Motion by Ryan. <laughs> Do I have a second? Second so, that. Yes. Second by Kevin. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please raise your right hand. All right. Do we want to second motion? I would suggest to table the minor site plan uh, to a date certain, uh, so we don't have well, to rewarn it. Oh, yeah, yeah. But well, do you feel like you can come back in a date certain with the minor site plan, or do you want to file a new application for that? Um. You know, I think that the, that the information that I need to have in order to figure it out would, would warrant another application. Okay. Sorry, just making sure. Okay. Because so if, if we can't do a date certain, it doesn't really make sense. Sure. I mean, we could, could, we could continue as well. I, I'm fine doing that if, if you're okay. And I know my board does this. If I, I can't show up, you'll move it, move it, kick it down yeah. the road. So do I mean, if you just indicate beforehand, and we've done that with plenty of other applications. Yeah. I mean, I, we can keep okay. doing it indefinitely we've as long as we've okay. done that. I mean, there's a point of absurdity where you know, I've, I've we're pretty tolerant. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll entertain a motion to table the minor site plan review to a date certain. Do you think, I mean, I don't want to. Uh, yeah, I mean, August 5th is the next one. But do you want to maybe give it to the to the one after that, which yes. would be the 19th? Yep. Okay, I'll move that we uh, continue the minor site plan application for 11 Baldwin until August 19th. Okay. Motion 7 by p.m. <laughs> <laughs> Montpelier City Hall. Motion by Ryan. Do I have a second? Yes. Second by Kevin. Is Any further discussion? Right all those in favor of the motion, please raise your right hand. All right. We'll, uh, we'll see you back. Good. Thank you all very much. Sure. Thank, you. Thank you, Brian. All right. Ooh. So, Ooh, zoom tight. Thank you. Uh, any other business that we wish to have on the public? 
record. Uh, I will note that our next meeting will be Monday, August 5th, 2019, at 7 p.m. at City Hall. Um, oh, sorry, 5th? Yes, August, August 5th. 5th. August 5th. August 5th. The next meeting. We're back on the 1 3 schedule. Yes. yes. All right, uh, then I will take a motion to go into deliberative session to consider the two sunset application. So moved. Motion by Kate. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Kevin. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. All right, we are in deliberative session.